I want to thank you for tuning in today. I'm going to talk about endo-AVF creation. This is something that people have been asking me about for some time now. Uh, please follow me on YouTube, Dr. Tamala's Vascular Channel, or on Twitter, at Srini Tamala, so that I can bring you uh, videos on a routine basis. When you really look the, at the history of uh, dialysis interventions, the first surgical fistula was created in 1966, and it wasn't until 51 years later that something really groundbreaking occurred, and that's the endo-AVF, or percutaneous dialysis fistula creation, as it's known. There are currently two devices on the market right now. One is by Avenue Medical called the Ellipsis device, and that was recently acquired by Medtronic. The other one is the BD Wavelength 4 French uh, endo-AVF uh, system. And both uh, devices use RF uh, to create the uh, fistula between the artery and the vein. With the Ellipsis device, you're really creating a connection between the dominant perforator uh, and the adjacent radial artery. With the Wavelength system, you're creating a connection between the common ulnar artery and the common ulnar vein. And I'm going to focus on this device since this is the one I currently use. So if you look at this picture, the yellow box is showing you really the common ulnar artery before it splits into the interosseous vessels and the pr proper ulnar artery. And the next one shows you the veins that are adjacent to it. And you're really connect, creating a connection here, just distal to the elbow joint, between the common ulnar artery and the common ulnar vein. Uh, and to show you what that looks like, here's an animation that kind of shows the process. You're basically getting access in an integrated fashion into the brachial artery and brachial vein. This, al this allows you, in the case of the four French system, to really put four French uh, sheaths in place. Then you can do your uh, angiography, whether it's arteriography, venography, et cetera. You, then you use a, a combination of catheters and guide wires to basically gain access to the common ulnar artery and the common ulnar vein, which then allows you, obviously, to place the electrodes to create the fistula. Now, these electrodes have magnets, which allow them to align. And once they're aligned and after uh, various maneuvers to make sure that you're in the correct location and everything is Align in alignment as it should be. You then create the fistula using a short RF pulse, which really lasts for less than one second. So what is important when you're looking at these devices and when you're evaluating patients? Well, ultrasound evaluation is everything. You really need to make sure that your arterial inflow into the arm is normal. So you want to have a normal brachial artery flow or waveform. And you need to make sure that the basilic vein and the cephalic vein are patent that there is a patent perforating vein, and that you have adequate access sites, whether that's going to be anagrade in the biceps region or via the wrist, which uh, I believe is considered off-label at this time. And you really want to use this ultrasound to help determine all these things and look for anything that may prevent you from creating this dialysis fistula percutaneously. Obviously, if they've had prior DVTs, AICDs, catheters, arm swelling, etc. You got to be very careful on which side you create the dialysis fistula, just as in the case of a, a surgically uh, created fistula. So let's talk about a few key things. What is a perforator vein? Well, the perforator vein is really a vein which perforates the deep fascia of the muscles. It connects the superficial veins to the deep veins where blood drains. So blood via the superficial drain veins drains through this perforator into the deep veins. And when you're creating this dialysis fistula, you need this perforating or bridging veins to be patent so that blood can flow from the deep common ulnar vein through these bridging veins or perforator vein into the superficial venous system and ultimately out the cephalic vein and or basilic vein. So what does that look like? Well, if you look venographically, these two pictures are really showing you what we're talking about here. The red arrow is really showing you a perforator. So that is a connection from the deep vein to the superficial veins. Commonly, blood flows from the superficial veins into the deep veins, but in the case of a uh, fistula where you have arterialization of the deep vein in this area, blood refluxes via this perforating vein or deep veins, oftentimes into a median cubital vein and ultimately into a cephalic or basilic vein, or in the case of dual outflow, both veins. And so if you look at the top image, the red arrow is showing you a nice perforator vein. You look at the bottom image, you can see it again. There's kind of a complex connection or network of bridging and perforator veins there. The other thing you want to look out for when you're creating these endo-AVFs is that you need to make sure you avoid the median nerve. Because, you know, if you've ever accessed the brachial artery or brachial or basilic veins uh, in the biceps region, you will always see this structure 
which is basically the nerve. And you need to avoid that, obviously, when you're accessing these vessels for, for good reason. So what does this look like? So here is an endo-AVF creation that I performed. Unfortunately, my hand was in the field of view, which I don't recommend. But I obtained uh, anti-grade access in the brachial artery. I have a forefront sheath in place. I have a guide wire that I'm using to gain access into the common ulnar uh, artery and then ultimately the proper ulnar artery. And the arteriogram below is really just to show you where I'm working and, and what I'm doing. Next, I accessed the brachial vein, and I did this because, again, we have to get access into the common ulnar vein in order to create this dialysis fistula percutaneously. The difficulty is that you are accessing these veins in a retrograde fashion, and so crossing the valves can be very difficult at times. And so when, when I did my initial venogram, we saw a little reflux where the red arrow is. And that was the tip-off to me that that might be our access point or access route. As a result, using that, I then proceeded with a, uh, in this case, a V18 or V14 guide wire. I like to use V18s in this case because I think they have more body and then creating a little bit of prolapse of that tip and then rotating it or twisting it as I am in that bottom image really allows you to get through those valves which can be difficult in a retrograde fashion as you can imagine. Once I was there, I have a catheter in place. The first image on the top shows the initial venogram, and you can see that there are some bridging veins, there's a perforating vein, there's a dominant median cubital vein, and then there's some flow out the cephalic vein uh, in this case. And once I uh, obtained access into the proper ulnar vein and confirmed my position, I was then ready to advance the electrodes, which I did here. The magnets allowed them to align. I then double-checked my positioning, if you look at the distal part of these electrodes, there are white squares, so we make sure that there's no parallax with the, the C-arm or the I-I on the angio suite you're using. We make sure that the distance between these uh, two devices is less than two millimeters, which I really saw at the time of ultrasound. And then on the bottom image, you can see that when I activate the device, you can see the patient kind of retracting his arm, and that's very common because of stimulation of the adjacent nerve. And so you want to hold these patients uh, arm down you know, either at the, at the forearm or wrist level as well as at the shoulder, uh, especially in patients where you're basically giving local and moderate conscious sedation. So once that was done, I did an arteriogram and you can see that the fistula has been created above. You can see the red arrows pointing to that little bulbous outpouching, which is showing you the connection between the artery, or in this case the common ulnar artery and the common ulnar vein. And the bottom image is again showing you the fistula with the superficial venous outflow. Obviously, before you finish this case, you also coil off the brachial vein that you've accessed because you want to divert more flow to the superficial venous system via the perforator and the bridging veins. What does that look like? So again, here, here's the fistula. Blood drains via bridging veins and a dominant perforator ultimately into a median cubital vein and out the cephalic vein and basilic vein in this case. So what does that look like when we look at this in more detail? Well, there's our fistula created between the common ulnar artery and the common ulnar vein. Here's the flow of blood. So if you follow the blue arrows, blood is coming down via the common ulnar artery, out the fistula, refluxing through a perforator vein, as you can see here, and ultimately into, in this case, a median cubital vein giving dual outflow consisting of both cephalic and basilic veins. And when we looked at this patient at two weeks, you can see that really the cephalic vein measured about three millimeters. The peak systolic velocity of the brachial artery flow is 58 centimeters per second. At four weeks, the peak systolic velocity of the brachial artery had increased to 181 centimeters per second. The cephalic vein has now increased from three to five millimeters, and by six weeks, we're almost 200 centimeters per second of flow with a cephalic vein that has really doubled in size from three and is now six millimeters. And it's just under the skin within six mil, it's, it's no deeper than six millimeters under the skin. And so this cephalic vein at six weeks was ready for cannulation. It had dilated over a six week period from three to six millimeters. Brachial artery velocity had increased from 58 to almost 200 centimeters per second. Cephalic vein flow rate was greater than 500 milliliters per minute, and the first cannulation uh, was performed at eight weeks. 
Now, once you've created these endo AVFs, you have to follow these patients and you have to communicate with the dialysis team. Endo AVF access veins are less prominent. It's a new location. The dialysis techs and nurses are not used to it. Significant training goes into helping them uh, access these veins and, and seeing where they can access them safely. Uh, although you may have a thrill, it's not as easy to feel as in a surgically created fistula because remember, these are low flow fistulas versus high flow fistulas. The outflow may be a single cephalic vein, dual cephalic and basilic vein, or in ca some cases, in a single basilic vein, in which case a superficialization of the basilic vein or a transposition of the basilic vein would need to be performed surgically. And so communication with your local dialysis surgeon is always key when you have uh, patients in these situations. And remember, education, education, training, training is really needed for the dialysis access nurses and the techs, that is the key. And when you look at post-endo AVF creation, you can see there's your cannulation zone. And you can see that the fistula, you can see a little bulge, but it's not as prominent. And so what I recommend is, once you see these patients and follow up and you're ready to allow access of this dialysis fistula, I basically map out the cephalic vein and I draw even numbers on the patient's arm for the first cannulation in terms of how um, deep the vein is and what the diameter of the vein is and where I, I want them to access this. So, you know, again, prior to first cannulation, it's important to look, listen, palpate, draw on the patient's arm, outline the access veins, and indicate depth in centimeters. And then obviously being there the first time, whether it's you or one of your nurse practitioners or physician assistants, or maybe there's clinical reps that can help you, that's really what you want to do. There's even a, a white paper on this that came out in the Journal of Vascular Access in 2019 on how to best to cannulate these patients and, and, uh, and went over patient selection, education, and so forth. And numerous studies have been published, including FLEX 2015, NEAT 2017, Pivotal 2018, EASE 2019, as well as a two-year cumulative patency of endovascular AV fistulas uh, in 2019 uh, to really talk about technical success, time to maturing, time to first cannulation, failure rates, and complications. And there was even a systematic review and meta-analysis in the Journal of Vascular Surgery in 2019, which included seven studies and 300 patients, and included both the uh, data from, of both devices with an overall technical success of 98%, with a high rate of uh, maturing and a, and a good patency rate. Obviously, there's also been studies showing that the cost of this type of dialysis fistula creation is lower compared to surgery, and there are less interventions needed per year uh, to maintain them. So in summary, there are many advantages to endo-AVF creation for uh, dialysis patients. It's an outpatient procedure. I typically can see patients within 48 hours and schedule them within three to five days. You typically don't need a chest x-ray, cardiology clearance, or anesthesia clearance because the procedure is performed with local anesthesia and moderate conscious sedation. Uh, and no general anesthesia. Some people like to use arm blocks. I don't use them, but uh, that's obviously operator dependent. There are no surgical incisions or scars. 85% of the time, these fistulas work and uh, two needle cannulation can be performed uh, within one to two months and on average at two months. And there are additional locations for the dialysis fistula creation as we talked about and different access sites uh, for the dialysis nurses and techs uh, to really obtain their access to perform uh, dialysis on these patients. There's no steel syndrome like you would see with a surgical fistula because remember, these are low flow fistulas created between the artery and vein compared to a surgical dialysis fistula, which is high flow. You don't see the typical surgical complications such as clamp injuries or intimal hyperplasia and fibrosis at the arterial anastomosis. Uh, because there's really no art arterial or venous manipulation. And any intrinsic outflow vein abnormalities are detected at the time of endo-AVF creation because you are performing a venogram uh, to look at the outflow veins uh, before creating these endo-AVFs. No surgical options are burned. Let's say your, your endo-AVF doesn't mature in a timely fashion. A surgical fistula can still be created, and the advantage is that these superficial veins are now mature and have plumped up because of the low flow fistula that was created. Overall cost at one year is lower than a surgical dialysis fistula and obviously patient satisfaction and quality of life is improved. 
But remember, it is early and we do need more data, and I'm sure that'll come out over the next uh, five years. I want to thank you for tuning in. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel, Dr. Tamala's Vascular Channel, and follow me on Twitter, at Srini Tamala, so that I can bring you new videos on a regular basis.